All right. Yeah. All right, well, good morning. I think we'll get started. I uh, want to welcome you to an event uh, this morning at ITF with uh, uh, where uh, uh, Jerry Hagee is going to talk about a new book that he has written on uh, restoring the innovative innovation edge. And um, so I'm going to really kind of just jump into it, but I want to share a couple of thoughts. First, first of all, uh, Jerry is uh, head of the, uh, he's Professor Emeritus and co-director of the Center for Innovation at University of Maryland. And uh, he has a really interesting background because he's been looking at the nexus between organizational innovation and sort of societal innovation and what really drives or what really drives innovation in organizations and how does the institutional setup or institutional system affect that. And in many ways that's kind of the central question I think facing the future of the United States is uh, we tend to have these debates that are all about one or the other, it's all about companies or it's all about the environment. And, and what I think is impressive about Jerry's book, Restoring the Innovative Innovation Edge, is that he's looking at this connection. Uh, I think one of the reasons why it's central is I was recently on a panel with um, uh, Clay Christensen from Harvard, who wrote uh, Innovator's Dilemma, and, uh, and also with Jeff Bezos. And, and, and Paul Jacobs uh, from Qualcomm. But anyway, one of the conclusions from this panel, uh, which I was struck by with all three of them, were quite concerned about uh, uh, America's ability to innovate, which was really surprising in a way, because normally you, you kind of hear just a lot of good, kind of almost happy talk, you know, we're innovative, uh, but the other countries aren't. And what all three of them said, and particularly uh, Clay Christensen, was that uh, U.S. companies have tended to default to incremental innovation and efficiency innovation, but not really breakthrough and transformative innovation. And I think that's right, and it's an important challenge, and I think we'll hear some of that today. So I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. He'll talk about the book. Uh, I probably might ask him a few questions, and then we should have plenty of time for our Q&A. Good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you for coming out. I should perhaps explain why I'm here, because I have absolutely no name recognition in the area of policy. I've been an academic all my life, but it's precisely because I became deeply concerned about not only the decline in the innovativeness of the United States, but the social and political decline that is combined with that, that I decided that maybe I should try and put my thinking camp on and see if I could come up with some new ideas for the policy uh, arena. And this book uh, is my uh, real first attempt uh, to do so. Um, and in it, there is some very, very simple ideas that can summarize the whole talk. Essentially, it's saying that as science and technology yeah, do you mind evolve. Because we got people on the, uh, on you. the internet. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'll stay like. fixed. <laughs> Uh, as making the world more and more complex. If that's the case, if you accept that, and I'll try and present some evidence to prove that, although I think it's self-evident, it means you have to create more and more complex arrangements in order to continue to have innovation, and that's a non-trivial conclusion. I might also add that one, another one of its implications is that you need to develop much more complex theories uh, and uh, there's some resistance uh, to that idea. Okay, so this is the cover of the book. The book attempts uh, to lay out um, a new policy model that I'll get into a, a little bit. But I I've been a little bit worried about connecting with you because you are in the policy world and I'm in the academic world. So I've been uh, doing some research on your website, Rob. <laughs> And picking up on various things and I decided what I would do is focus this talk on manufacturing because that's been a theme and also focus the talk on the comparisons between Germany and the United States because there was this very interesting panel that I applaud but I also thought that was interesting in the panel that the Germans never talked about their failures in their innovation system there was no word of this and they have problems and when one woman raised the question uh, about, well, what are the origins of this system? Uh, the Germans could not provide an answer, which is also interesting. And, and I, I want to explain that because when you look at other countries and you try and borrow ideas, frequently you don't necessarily understand the depth 
of what's going on. Uh, Rob mentioned the institutions and uh, that have been in place. So if you borrow the German model, it's important to understand the long-term historical circumstances. I, I can't get into that, but one of my areas is um, uh, European history over the last two centuries. Um, buried in this model uh, is a new socioeconomic paradigm. Um, I am an academic. <laughs> I am interested in writing more complex socioeconomic theories. Uh, it's probably no interest to any of you, um, but it's their sub rosa, and hopefully in uh, in doses. Okay, this is my description of the present policy model. Um, it pretty much focuses on the macro or the societal level. Science and technology are lumped together. There, of course, focuses on information technology, nanotechnology. Everybody has their favorite lists of scientific areas that they like to look at. But generally, it's writ large. Uh, a lot of discussion on, uh, particularly if you take the National Academy report and its update in 2010 on the need for more funding and more training. Uh, interestingly enough, except for discussing math and science uh, in the primary grades, not very much attention uh, to a number of the singular strengths of the German educational system of higher technical specialists they have technical universities that we don't have any counterpart to in this country. And again, that's just to give you a background on if you wanted to borrow the German model, uh, it's not so easy to do uh, immediately. My biggest complaint is it's static. As uh, any of you are economists, you probably know that in Europe, they're now pushing an evolutionary model of economics that's been resisted in this country. And my feeling is that if you accept the idea of Moore's law, uh, about changes every 18 months, then that has a number of implications, it seems to me, about what you want to do uh, relative to science and technology. There are, of course, discussions of market failures and in need for incentives and so on, but in general, um, I think there's not enough attention paid to the, a number of reasons why we don't have more innovativeness. And of course, productivity measures overlap somewhat with innovation, but they don't ne necessarily measure innovation as directly as one might want. It's an input-output model uh, based on market regulation. So what's the model that I'm proposing in this book? Well, obviously, I'm taking each of those things and doing the opposite. So rather than focus on the society, let's focus on sectors. You take any variable you want, and on that variable, every sector is different. There's just no exception to that. And in anything, they're getting more and more different with time. Rather than uh, talk about research and um, technology and development, I think we really need to unfold, break up the black box into six different areas. Uh, Tossi has started to work in that area, and uh, uh, I, I would like to push a little bit farther and I'll explain how. The book argues that within the United States at minimum there are four policy levels that you have to intervene at. There's the team, the organization, the sector, and the society. And at each of those levels there are different obstacles and blockages. Furthermore, none of those obstacles or blockages come cost free. Every remedy has attached to it certain costs. Furthermore, different remedies have to be used not only in different sectors, but in different organizations. Uh, this is a kind of complexity that uh, a lot of people do not like, but I think it is the reality. Now, another theme that I would like to touch upon today, the thinking that it might be of interest to you, is are there new kinds of policy studies that need to be made in order to advance the cause of innovation? And I, I want to argue that built into this model are some ideas, and I, I want to suggest some of those as I, I proceed. This is a throughput model rather than an input-output model. It's really saying, irrespective of the amount of money you spend on R&D and the number of scientists you train, the question is, how do you manage them? That's the real issue. How do you manage that process of moving some bright idea that's half-baked 
<laughs> into a commercialized product. Um, this is the black box. Uh, one of the arguments of the book, and Rob uh, very nicely introduced it, is uh, we have to get away from incremental innovation into radical innovation. Furthermore, we need two kinds of radical innovations, both product and process, and that's in each of these six areas. And you might say, well, what does process innovation mean in basic research? It's a reference to the tools and techniques that are used to do the research. And you just march through these different areas. And because I thought it might be particularly interesting to you uh, to talk about manufacturing and quality research, I, as I said, I would uh, focus my talk uh, on that. Uh, later on. Okay, how is the world changing? How is it becoming more complex? And let's start with the simplest of examples. Namely, we solve simple problems first, and then that leaves the more difficult problems. So vaccines cure disease, but gene therapies are extraordinarily complicated. We used to think that we could cure genetic diseases with a single gene. Now we know not only are there different genes for the same cancer, melanoma, for example, but there are genes in a bowel regulation. And furthermore, the messages are different by different pathways, and the context is different. Or you can take aviation. There's certainly, it's simple to have right flight, but then jet planes, to say nothing about supersonic. Take any particular area you want to, and if you think about it, you recognize very clearly that progress means tackling a much more difficult problem. Furthermore, the scope of the problem grows. Uh, that's clear in the gene example, if we go to atmospheric, uh, interestingly enough, I do a lot of consulting with NOAA, and they're only now putting together ocean circulations and atmospheric circulations to try and come up with more complex models. And note that they also are discovering that in each of those areas, uh, they not only need 24-hour day models, they need six-hour models. One reason why they're not good at predicting tornadoes, I might add, uh, and so on. So the scope of problems continuously grows. And not only does the importance of cost increase because of deficits, but the definition of what is a cost has changed over time. We now talk about eliminating many different kinds of costs, such as, I kind of been very good with this idea of externalities. I really like it. What are the various costs that are not paid for in the product to the individual and to the environment and so on? All right, now, if it is the case, if you accept this kind of evidence, and it, it strikes you as true, note the rather important implication. Research teams, to be innovative, have to grow in diversity and in size. And more and more, you have to worry about the connections between <coughs> organizations. And in the October 18th discussion, that came across very clear. The Germans kept talking about networks, networks, networks. And they're right, right, right. Uh, but know how it connects to this evolutionary sequence. And it suggests, that if you accept all this argument, that they're better placed to take advantage of the evolution of science and technology than countries that don't do this. All right. At the meso level, and this is a meso theory because it's a sector level theory rather than a societal level theory, this is a description of the pharmaceutical <coughs> and biotech uh, industry. And uh, the strength of the arrows are based on patent studies. This happens to be one of those <laughs> favorite topics <laughs> on academic researchers. Uh, they're doing to this area exactly what the genesis did to fruit flies. This is sort of our fruit fly. And they've collected a large amount of data, which is extremely helpful in coming along and talking about it. And this is based on patent data, uh, all the patent data through all the 90s. And what you discover is that most of those patents are involve either the public research laboratories and universities, universities, 
or biotech companies, but the arrows start getting pretty thin when you go to the pharmaceutical companies. This is the United States now we're talking. And then we have essentially a valley of death problem <coughs> between the National Institutes of Health. Now recently they've come to recognize it, always in these talks, things are changing and one has to try and work very hard to try and keep up to the last minute uh, data. But so far, uh, to my knowledge, there are not many patents that have come out. Now, the theory argues that in order to get more focus and more depth, you have to, in effect, differentiate these research organizations and evidence for other sectors besides pharmaceutical and biotech is given in the book. But if you're going to get commercialized advantages out of that, positive trade balances, then under those circumstances, you have to connect those different parts. And that's where the strength of the arrows comes in. Did you know that we have a very large trade deficit in health products, even though this country per capita spends more money on medical research than any other country? Isn't that interesting? And a lot of the problem is because of the pharmaceutical companies and the public research laboratories. Beyond that, the single most successful pharmaceutical company is an Israeli firm, Teva. It sells more prescription drugs than all our pharmaceutical companies put together. And you're probably aware that the number of drugs developed by the American pharmaceutical companies has been in decline. Okay, since Germany was discussed on the 18th of October, what's the situation in Germany? It's interestingly enough, the exact opposite. Their problem, is they can't differentiate biotech companies. In 1989, they had only 18. At that time, the United States had over 386. Um, but what they can do and is, and this is what is unfortunate about they're not talking about failures on October 18th. It's how the system responds to failure. It does something. So they got together and created a whole series of different kinds of incentives to create biotech firms. Uh, and within five years time, they had over 280. A lot of them concentrated around Munich. Historical reasons for that, we don't need to go into that. Uh, and, uh, and then they really started developing uh, success in this area. Now, uh, some footnotes. The German system, for reasons I'll explain on the next slide, continues to have a problem where the United States does not. Uh, our problem is we can do the radical innovations that get the patents. How do we convert the patents into commercialized products? The German problem is how do they do the radical innovations to get the patents uh, that are more commercially successful? So a very intense study has been done of the kinds of research going on in the German biotech firms rather than the American biotech firms. And that's the interesting difference. They tend to do more incremental innovation than is true in the American case. I, I just want you to feel a little bit better so I <laughs> with build your morale up <laughs> by saying no perfect system out there. But note, note. Every system has its Achilles heel, but you have to do something about it. The Germans do something about it. And that's, I think, why it was a tragedy they didn't discuss failure. Okay, this is for the woman who went nameless, uh, I didn't hear her name, who asked <laughs> why, oh, sorry. Um, why do the Germans have these cooperative relationships? Obviously, we don't. Ha I don't have time to give you a, a history lesson, and you wouldn't be interested anyway. Um, but the major reason is uh, they have a, a coordinated market economy, and this takes place in a whole series of different areas. They first started coordinating industry and research at the University of Munich back in the 1880s. They coordinated vocational and technical education in the 1870s. Furthermore, the coordination of many of these things that goes on in Germany occurs because they involve labor unions as well as banks. 
as well as uh, the large companies involved in the coordinating. That's a quasi-corporatist structure. Now, its weakness is, of course, that people tend not to take risks. Some of the criticisms of Europe and the safety net are correct. That's true. But the positive side of it is that when they do, they work together quite effectively. And interestingly enough, the pharmaceutical companies in Europe, and particularly in German, Bayer, and so on, work very effectively across European boundaries and also with American companies much more effectively than in ours, uh, um, American pharmaceutical companies. And the consequence of that is, despite having fewer patents, they get a higher payoff. And this speaks to one of the issues that Rob raised at the introduction of the talk on October 18th. I said to Rob, I was going to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> so, well, they have spent less money, uh, GDP, but they're getting more out of it. And here is the reason. That network cooperation allows them to get more out of it. The U.S., opposite advantages, opposite disadvantages. We have a lot of risk takers, but our risk takers want to make a lot of money and they're unwilling to cooperate. And the consequence of that is, uh, there, is enorm there are enormous problems over this. And the book gives you examples where various companies gave up on intellectual property and then started making a lot of money when they did it. So there are, I, I think, important ways <coughs> of handling that. But this means it's difficult to borrow the German model um, and it's unfortunate because there's much to it. Okay, now, um, <laughs> I, the, none of this data is in the book. I've updated all the data uh, since the book was published. As I say, things are changing rapidly. The decline is accelerating. Uh, I noticed I signed a permission release. Six and seven I did very rapidly, Rob, so don't hold me to it. There's uh, probably some errors in that. I should go back and recount. <laughs> but I, I, wanted, I wanted to update it just for this talk today. Um, and uh, I think you know all this, so I don't really need to go about it uh, very much. But I, I think what's more interesting is, first of all, uh, this is why you need a sector-specific spe sector view. It's not everywhere. Uh, there are some success stories, and here they are. What I did is this 2010 data, again, it's not in the book. I took every single area where we had uh, trade balances of five billion or more, and then every area where we don't, we have a net deficit of five billion or more, and put them up there. Also, since I'm a sociologist, I want to point out that, oh, that's interesting, fiscal crisis suddenly moved over. <laughs> you know the crisis should be over on the right. Sorry, but it was all right on my website, but never mind. The previous view graph was the, ag was the aggregate, right? When you said overall sectors. But the then previous one said also had an error, did you say? No, he said it's previous, That is aggregated over all sectors. Yeah, go back one. Yeah, the, one, the previous one you just had on. Go back. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That's why it's so important to make the sector right. distinction. Okay. Um, That's not for No, it's a total loss of $85 billion. There's some areas where there is not a loss, to be concrete about it. Yeah. All right. Now, um, one of the things that's interesting about this is we've got a lot of discussion going on in the United States today about the fiscal crisis. And note that as more and more sectors are in decline and fewer and fewer sectors have positive trade balances, uh, the fiscal crisis just grows and the political conflict grows as well. There's another, as a sociologist, I may not concern any of you again, uh, but as a sociologist, one, another thing that's declining because of the fiscal crisis and the political conflict is what we call social capital. The trust in institutions, the trust in other people, uh, the willingness to cooperate. In other words, insofar as the science and the technology system are evolving where you need cooperation, we are moving away from it. And that has very dramatic implications for any attempt to try and solve 
the innovation crisis. Sorry, it's a downer, but and that's why I, I, I got concerned, is because I've seen this coming for some time now. Now, a number of you probably do the same thing I do. I do a little bit of consulting and so on. And in particular areas where you do the consulting, I, I think, at least for me, and I don't know if that's true for any of you, again, there are probably bright spots, it's impressive how much that decline is taking place because of the lack of developing new technologies. And I want to talk about one area that I uh, do that consulting in, and that's with NOAA and um, STAR is the Applied Research Unit of NOAA. It develops the algorithms that take signals from satellites and converts it into weather prediction. Um, and I want to talk about it because you've just seen some tornadoes in the newspaper, and I like to try and make my talks relevant to what you're reading in the newspapers. In 2003, Congress voted down a new instrument to be thrown into space called a hyperspectral suite. What this would have done is allowed the United States to measure water and, uh, and temperature and pressure in many, many more places and much, much more frequently so that they could rapidly update weather forecasts. You know, our weather prediction service only updates every 12 hours. There are a lot of reasons that I go into why that's so. But you cannot catch tornadoes because those lows suddenly shift and you can get unstable conditions just in the space of a couple of hours. Oddly enough, with this hyperspectral suite, it could have been married to desktop computing so that weather forecasters in each part of the country could rapidly uh, update uh, and measure it. And, and, and not knowing where that low is and whether or not there's suddenly double cells makes an enormous amount of difference. Uh, for those of you who lived in Washington in 2001, that unannounced <laughs> snowstorm that left two feet was because they placed the low out at sea rather than in land, and so it was totally unseen. There was a flood, and I think I referenced it in the book in 2007 in the subways in New York. So knowing that it is important. Um, that's just one example, and the one that I know fairly well, of what happens if you don't keep investing in upgrading your technologies. And one consequence of that is the Europeans did put up the hyperspectral suite. Now, most of the really interesting research in short and medium term forecasting is going on in Europe, not in the United States. And that's what NOAA is saying. There we go. Okay. I said that I think the innovation process is a complex one that exists at four levels. What the book does is try and lay out a series of obstacles. There are obviously more than eight obstacles, <laughs> but nowadays they don't like to publish long books. So, <laughs> tailor make it. <laughs> That's partially a joke. Eight is, I just thought, a. Area, is it valley of death or value of death? It's valley of death. I thought value so. of death is a good obstacle, too, but. Uh. <laughs> Unattended pun. <laughs> Anyway, static strategies. The book gives you predictions as to how consumers' value systems are changing across time and what's driving it. In other words, if we know how, what values consumers want, then we can position our companies and our researchers in the, in the public sector to prepare for those new things. They want technological sophistication. They want good design. Apple, of course, is the case of point. And furthermore, uh, they're more and more concerned about customization. In fact, customization turns out to be the really big problem, not just in the private sector, but in the public sector as well. How do you customize education, health, and, and, and national security, and so forth? Or to say nothing about military wars, they have to be customized as well. Uh, 
our, a lot of our problems are low risk research. There was an article about uh, the National Cancer Institute where again I do a lot of work. Um, I have a particular interest uh, about always doing incremental research and Rob gave you an example of what various Harvard people uh, increasingly have come to recognize. Uh, Interestingly enough, you can create these research teams, but the people don't necessarily talk to each other. So another problem is how do you get communication? And particularly if the team spans organizational boundaries, and especially if it's between the public and the private sector uh, with different agendas. Uh, Stovepipes, a common problem. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about General Motors, but uh, there's been very little discussion of the fact that one of the reasons why it went under outside of the fact it was being managed by financial managers who kept buying and selling companies. But its problems went back a long time and were still with pipe problems, and the book describes that. We tend to have reactive leaders rather than transformational, and I noticed Rob used that term. It's a term I like too much, and yes, that is Valley of Death. Uh, and of course, there's been, uh, I'm going to talk more about industrial policy, but I also want to talk about non-visible blockages. Um, one of the themes of the book is the world is more complicated than your view of it. And so what you have to do is do active research policy studies. And I think that's one of the things I'm trying to sell in the book, is our need to go in and start looking at particular areas. Uh, and let me just go back here. If we go back here, I would love to see a policy study that compares two niches of chemicals where we have positive trait balances with two areas of chemicals where we have negative trade balances. Now my hypothesis is, but I don't know this, I don't know this at all, but this is a point of theory, deductive theory, is that the one set does have solved a network kind of arrangement where there are connections, and the other has not. And we know in healthcare that it has not. But that would be a, an example of a kind of policy study that could be very informative and sort of say, well, here, here it, it turns out to be true, and it may not be. I'm enough of an academic to know that I'm wrong lots of times. <laughs> so um, I am rapidly running out of time. I am going to say another thing. I think when one wants to talk about manufacturing, you want to go and look at why is it failing. Now the standard shtick on this is that uh, jobs have been exported overseas because wages are lower. Uh, not true. It's partially true. But it's largely false. And the reason why it's largely false is that American manufacturers had the opportunity to do flexible manufacturing, the second industrial divide, but they didn't do it. And they didn't do it for a variety of reasons, uh, whereas the Germans and Middle Italy, not Northern Italy, uh, have done this. And uh, the book goes into it, but a lot, of the, uh, a lot of it boils down to not only managerial failures, but engineering failures, a poor design, so they eliminated the flexibility in the adaptiveness system. And since I'm running out of time, and I want to leave you uh, on an upbeat note, uh, I, want to, I want to suggest a vision, a vision for manufacturing uh, that might help the United States get out of its mess. And that is the third industrial divide. If the second industrial divide was simply the ability to change the, the parts on the assembly line so that we could do both um, trucks and cars, as, as I saw in Mr. Beachy when I visited the plant once, then the real trick is to change the composition of those parts. We have an example of military equipment. Uh, they uh, just shows you on the screen what they're doing, but the important thing is they now have body protection armor that has one half the weight and twice the protective capacity. They can make tanks now that consume one half the amount of gasoline. Think of all those advantages being worked throughout the economy in many different sectors. And since I think I've run out of time, I will stop there and skip all this about different kinds and
That's who I am. Good. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, so that was great. Let me um, ask a couple of questions first, and then I'll open it up uh, to folks here because we have a, a good bit of time to get into discussion. I think one part that struck me about what you said was the need to focus on sectors. And I find I have found that sort of that, that can maybe one of the hardest messages to get across in Washington, because the focus is either on uh, on individuals, uh, we'll just get K through 12 education and then everything will be great, or it's on macroeconomic and 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 even talking about sectors, uh, you're accused of uh, all sorts of awful sins against neoclassical economics. Um, but I think what your point is is that each sector, and even even within a sector like chemicals that there are really fundamental differences. Obviously, the difference between healthcare and chemicals is huge, or between banking and aviation. But, but, but the, so it strikes me that the challenge in Washington is twofold, One, well, threefold. One is to recognize that a sector-based look at the world is really critical. Right. Then to begin to do the analysis, uh, actually timely, we have a report that will be coming out sometime in the spring really looking at what is the capability of the U.S. government to do in-depth sectoral competitive innovation analysis. And, and the bad news is it's pretty thin. It's really, really thin. We, we've dismantled much of that capability over the last 15 years. And then the second part of that, though, is policy, that, that, that sort of thinking about differentiated policy interventions. Uh, we just did an event last week on innovation in the construction industry. We had um, the head of construction for NIST, and we had the uh, DOD Undersecretary for Facilities and, and Buildings. And what was striking about that was how different that industry is compared to some other industry, and how the solutions and the tools are different to solve it. So maybe you could just say a little bit more about uh, you know, that whole dynamic and how you see that playing out. I'm not sure what your question is. Are your question, is your question um, underneath all that? How do we sell Washington on a sector approach? Is, is that yeah, your yeah. basic question? Yeah, so why is it so hard? I, one That's reason I think watching. it's hard is, is economists don't understand sectors. They don't study sectors. They study macro, and economic policy is dominated by economists. Uh, but maybe you have other ideas. Well, the only, uh, the only I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I don't necessarily have good answers, but the one thing that has occurred to me is a possibility, is to do comparative sector studies in depth with another country. So for example, uh, I tried to get, but was unsuccessful, funding to compare seemingly unimportant tomato uh, production and processing in Italy with the United States. In 1948, we exported tomatoes throughout the world. Now we're importing them. And the Italians have done a marvelous job because of their particular institutes uh, in, in that area. Um, likewise, um, it, if you, I, I, I got, try to get another s sector study going, comparing France and the United States in the area of nuclear engineering and computers arguing that the country, well, each country succeeds in some sectors and fails in others, and isn't that interesting? But uh, I haven't gotten funding for these, but that would be my approach. Now, uh, note that that's an academic speaking, and it, it takes time, and it may uh, therefore, but how can an economist argue against the sector differences when they themselves admit that there are oligarchies and competitive markets. But more importantly, uh, there are econometric models uh, that do sector by sector analysis and aggregate it up. We have that at, at Maryland. Sure. Yeah, no, I, that, that, that actually sounds fascinating. I mean, the, the, why are the French so good at nuclear engineering and they're, they're world leaders in it? We, we're, not as good, and part of it's a part of it's a. I, I think is a demand issue that they've organized demand in a, in, a, in a certain way around mass production. But learning there are other there are important. some other reasons. It happens to be uh, um, I do a lot of work on Britain, France, Germany, and Italy, and and uh, I've lived in France as well, and I, I happen to have access to Ministry of Plan 
and they're energy expert. Uh, now he's French and, and I've never validated what he said, but it's a story that I think has verisimilitude. He said the French kept going back to Westinghouse asking them to change various design issues for safety and Westinghouse kept refusing. So France bought the patents and solved their technological problem that way. Yeah, interesting. So my other question, and then I'll open it up, is, um, you know, I think one of the big, uh, maybe the second big problem in the U.S. debate is we tend to have this view that, um, you know, I thought your framework of you know, sort of a, an innovation system organized around kind of liberal market economics versus one that's organized more around uh, cooperative systems, that we get into this debate in the U.S. that, you know, one is better than the other, and, you know, we're all right, or they're all right, and it seems to me the real challenge is that, that high, we, we have a, a, high, a, a lot of strengths around our liberal system, if you will. I'll try to make that clear. Yeah. Uh, Risk-taking, entrepreneurship, new firm formation, much better than almost any country in the world. But we have systemic weaknesses, too, uh, that other countries like Germany, uh, Austria, Sweden have been able to capitalize on. And I guess the really the $64,000 question is, is there a way for each country who has these options to begin to move more towards the middle view, not to give up their real advantages, but to strengthen their weaknesses. And it's very hard politically for us to even have that conversation. How can we strengthen these weaknesses without turning into Euro-socialists, which you know, we all don't want to do? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm pessimistic about being able to borrow institutional patterns from another society. Um, and they have a long history. So then the question really comes is, if we don't have that option, do we have another one? That's your question, really, basically. And my feeling is, again, we do have some interesting examples of, of where that cooperation occurs, Silicon Valley. Now, I think a lot of people have misunderstood why Silicon Valley works. Uh, and But leaving aside whether I have the right answer or not, the key is to always within a country, when you're trying to change policy, find a successful model and let's say, can we now replicate this? Now, I'm, I didn't get to it, but one of the really successful models that I think is out there to be pushed is the agricultural extension model that built American agriculture and resulted in incredible surpluses that we didn't know what to do with. Boy, we wish we had some of those back now. Um, and my argument is for small and medium-sized industries in different sectors, here is a model that could be very attractive to a lot of congressmen because we're talking about a lot of different states. I mean, when you advocate policy changes, you have to count votes. And it seems to me this is one way you could get a lot of votes. And in general, I think most people are positive about the agricultural research extension model. Sure. And of course, we have the manufacturing extension partnership, which is modeled after that. But again, compared to other countries, we don't fund it very well. Uh, so why don't we, if you can uh, identify yourself uh, and who you're with, and then uh, ask a question or make a comment. Hi, my name is Jason Lemons from Congressman Jim McDermott's office. Uh, and my I'm sorry, where from? Congressman Jim McDermott's office. Right. Mm -hmm. um, my question would be, how do sort of proof of concept centers fit into your vision of a cooperative framework or something like that that connects yeah. um, industry to academic? Uh, uh, normally, uh, proof of concept is is used uh, in the product development stage, and uh, we had at one time that just got resurrected the Advanced Technology Program at NIST, which was an extremely interesting program. Uh, that I was uh, that I wanted to go back and study because I felt that one of its singular weaknesses was they asked for proof of concept and never asked for manufacturing research to solve all the problems after the proof of concept, and it's it's that's where the big trade off, or not trade off, but the transfer is a better word, uh, really is a problem. So I think we do proof of concept very well. I think the upscaling into solving the manufacturing problems is the real issue. And again, supporting small and medium-sized businesses won't uh, help us very much unless we also help those businesses solve that problem. 
Yeah, I mean the new Amtec proposal that NIST has is an attempt to solve that right. around yeah. manufacturing technology. Did you have a follow up? A little bit. Um, okay. I guess, what about sort of looking at the I6 grants, which have been doing it, their focus on trying to leverage the proof of concept funding and, and getting out of that, sort yes. of skipping that valley of death to yes. get the venture capital funding. Well, there, there is a night, as long as you're doing that, do you know about the military's model here? Um, my age, I'm forgetting the name. There is a nice venture capital company created by the military. In Kutel. In Kutel. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, DOD has one as well. Yes, they do. Um, but I think they're much uh, newer and not as far advanced as Incatel. But Incatel is a nice model because what they do is sort of say, well, with three years we get the proof of concept, but we now need another three years to develop the manufacturing. And that example of third industrial divide is from Incatel, going beyond the proof of concept. Other questions? Um, I you had a, oh, Philip Weber, Congressional Budget Office. Mm. I had a more conceptual question of your typology. Uh, it seems to me if you're going to characterize the United States as, as you did early on, as having uh, that uh, open innovation that encouraged uh, spin-offs and, and uh, encouraged uh, risk-taking, then that model doesn't have a valley of death because you're, I mean, people don't jump out of organizations to die. They must be a mechanism that allows the people who decide to spin off to get funding and survive. No one's going to walk out the door if his job is going to be over in 18 months. Uh, not true. Uh, and first of all, uh, the spin-offs, uh, uh, I'm glad you raised the question because it allows me to clear up some confusion in my talk. The spin-offs are mainly attached to universities. And the universities make it very easy for you to do double duty. You know, I'm only required to teach four days. The other three days I can do whatever I want and make. And actually, they don't even force the four days. You can't do that in your civil service regulations and so on, prevent that. So a lot of the spin-offs that are occurring in the high-tech area are these. I did a study of biotech in this area, and I talked to them, and they kept saying to me, as long as we keep getting venture capital, we're fine, and, and the, which is you know, contrary to your assumption about people being uh, willing to move into these areas um, without necessarily being able to solve the valley of death problem. Now. Um, it is a problem in Europe, and they did something that was very exciting. In Sweden, uh, because they had so many engineers concerned about their job security, what they did, and it'll be interesting to see if Germany copies this, uh, because they probably need to, uh, at Ericsson they said, you know what we're going to do? Uh, you're worried about failing. Start your small enterprise, and if you fail, we'll come back and give you a job. And they had hundreds of people moving out and starting their small high-tech businesses with that kind of job security, which then made Stockholm a Silicon Valley in a particularly important area. So I, 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 it, it's interesting because, again, we have a case of a European country dealing with its basic failure in a very innovative way. But uh, a lot of Americans will start businesses, in fact, my son's about to start one, <laughs> with no guarantee of success. I mean, that's the positive side of it. But, I mean, but you, then your model is strictly for universities. You said the spin-offs you were talking about were universities, but my impression is, I don't know much about biotech, but certainly Silicon Valley has a rich Yes. And world renowned history of private did, sector yeah, spin offs. Yeah, if good. those private sectors were all facing the valley of death, then those guys wouldn't do it. 
because they are smart people. They are just as smart as us. In fact, they're smarter than me because that's how they can come up with those great ideas. And they'd see, oh, there's no funding, therefore I'm not going to do it. So you either have to posit, you have to posit some mechanism logically that says, why are these people leaving silicon established firms to go off to new firms? How do they get funding? How do their products come to market? But you're, Either you have you're a making an interesting assumption, which I don't accept. Yes. You, you can make it. You're assuming that most people are motivated by money. I, I can assure you that a lot of people with bright ideas, that's not the issue. I have a large study going on on what produces satisfaction in the national public laboratories. It has nothing to do, or very little to do, with salaries. It's the ability to try and create new ideas and so on. So a lot of people <coughs> are driven by a particular vision. And that, and, and I, I'm not saying everybody, but that's an important driver. But then you're saying US, I mean, you posited Europe versus the United States, Europeans are you saying we're genetically different, that we are more, we will work more for the idea and they will work more for the security? I'm saying that the nature of our institutional boundaries and the way we've been raised and our institutional history encourages the Rambos of the world to rise in the United States and not in Europe. There is, I mean, again, these are very gross generalizations with all sorts of exceptions. I, 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 and it doesn't mean that they don't have bright ideas in, in Europe. They do have bright ideas, but the willingness to take risks is different between the two countries. I, and I think if you talk, you, know, you don't have to accept my word for it. If you go and talk to any European about these things, I think they would say it. Now, the exception, of course, is England. England is more like the United States. I think what, one of the things you're doing is, is, I think it is pretty clear that the U.S. has a more of a risk-taking propensity. And the question, one, one could say, well, it's because people moved here, and therefore you're sort of in a Darwinian natural selection. <laughs> that, 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 no, I'm serious, people who are, you, you, you want to move here uh, on a ship and you don't have any money, that's a huge risk. Uh, and, and you're willing to upset the status quo and do that. And a lot of Americans, that's the story of Americans. But the Canadians did that too, more or less, uh, and they're not very entrepreneurial compared to the U.S. I mean, they, they're, they're, the, the challenge the Canadians face, so I think it is something more than that. It, I, I think partly it's about this American tradition. But I guess my only comment was, you know, it, the question I think that, that, that maybe Jerry's getting at was, we do have a lot of uh, stuff coming over the valley of death. The question is, is it optimal? And I would argue we've got a bigger supply than we're transferring over. So there's a lot of stuff that still stays on the side that doesn't ever get over. So some places yeah. in the country do a good job of that, but we haven't optimized our system. Yeah. Uh, we have natural advantages, yeah. but we haven't optimized it through policy. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I buy the genetic uh, migration <laughs> argument. Your theory. Uh, <laughs> But what I can tell you is uh, that the difference between Canada and the United States and Australia relative migrations is Canada got captured by the landed gentry, and that's the class model. The United States has been captured by the middle class model. And if you look at migrations across 100 years of time, with some major exceptions, but particularly post-Second World War, there are massive middle-class migrations, the Cubans, the Iranians, the Vietnam. There are exceptions to that, but these middle-class people uh, have a very different worldview, and they buy into uh, you know, a lot of the American dream. <laughs> if I could just make a comment on yourself. Yes. Uh, I'm David Drinkard with the Department of State. If I could just make a comment on, on what you're discussing, I think there's other factors that aren't related to innovation that get into these U.S. European, such yes, as labor absolutely. laws. Have you ever tried to fire a European? Um, that's not an easy process. Bankruptcy laws. You know, these are the system is there to allow you to succeed or to fail, and you get higher reward if you succeed. Yeah. And 
it's it's a much easier way to fail here than in a lot of other countries as well. I think that needs to be taken into consideration. So another point is the role of government in all of this is, and it's not just you know innovation policy. Yes, I hope I didn't imply that it was, but I, I totally agree with you. I mean, but we need get into the details and, and, and your, your point is well taken. And one of the things uh, that also prevents uh, entrepreneurship uh, in, um, uh, in European countries is a very high uh, wage bill. And France, uh, it's 80% uh, of your wages have to go for fringe benefits. That's an enormous barrier to, um, uh, to starting small businesses. And they're trying to do things about that, but the, that security blanket has costs. Right. Logan Albright, American Action Forum. I was just wondering what you think about the use of X prizes to encourage uh, radical innovations as opposed to incremental innovations. X prizes? They're large cash prizes, oh. usually privately funded, that encourage things like space elevators or cure for AIDS and things like that, big major yeah. innovations. Um, uh, I have a bias. I think uh, a lot of ideas are half-baked, but the problem is to decide which part of the, of the baking is bad. And therefore, uh, for me, the real issue is what do you take with the various ideas and how do you transform them and, how, and why do you need a research team to do that? And it, the interesting thing is if you look at the history of science and you say, well, what are the composition of creative teams as opposed to less creative teams? It isn't just the person with the bright idea. It's the critic who picks apart the bright idea. And uh, T.S. Eliot has this marvelous essay on the problem of poets not being able to evaluate their poetry. <laughs> problem with people with big ideas, too. <laughs> So I guess maybe to go Jerry to the point that because we do have we have had some success with prizes in, 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 in policy where um, um, you know there was the space prize and there's been other prizes that have been, been valuable. Do you think that's a useful tool in the arsenal? I think the single most important tool to deal with a whole series of problems that concern you is to give prizes to teams, not individuals. Start breaking down Rambo as an image. Sure. Uh, this is kind of follow-up. Would you make a distinction between uh, grand challenges and prizes? <laughs> it's not, well, I, I know about grand challenges in the context of the National Research Laboratories. Um, of highlighting areas versus providing particular yeah. prizes. Um, I, uh, I think you can define that in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, I, th I think it's been an attempt on the part of some of the laboratories to try and encourage radical innovation. Um, I'm not always sure they do a good job of analyzing the number of different competencies they need to really achieve those challenges. And on the basis of my research at Sandia, I can also say that they tend not to fund these long enough. But we have again the same problem. We get to the proof of concept and then they don't take the next step. Part of that is, of course, Congress. Um, I guess if you could speak a little bit about the, in practical terms, what do you mean by more sectoral analysis and specifically moving towards a sectoral analysis model, like changing institutions or what are you thinking of? Well, the, the nice thing about uh, a sector approach, it seems to me, is it then has to be married with four levels. One is you look at the research teams and you do it in six different arenas and whether or not those teams are connected or not connected. You look at the organizations involved, whether it's universities and or national laboratories or organizations. You then look at the particular nature of that sector in terms of 
uh, at, at global uh, competition and national competition, a number of different firms and research organizations. And then the society, whether or not there are particular institutional regulations that apply to that sector. And with the sector, as opposed to, to the society, it's easier to see the four levels and it's easier to see the differences rather than the general rules. And, that, and that's very important. But then the, the problem would be to identify what are all the blockages at each of those different levels, which is what uh, the book goes into. I guess my question was, how do you institutionalize sectoral analysis and the practical aspects of doing that? I mean, that, that was more my question, okay. if you have ideas for that. Uh, <laughs> fund me. <laughs> no, no uh, I, uh, I wrote the book with hope that uh, there would be changes in the data that NSF collects and there would be increasing awareness of the importance of doing uh, sectorial analysis. Do I think that's enough? No. I would like to get a study going on the chemical industry. I, I think I will be going to Australia uh, to accept a chair in innovation there and part of the reason why I'm going is that they're very much interested in launching a program of research on innovation that would involve these multiple levels. And so I see it as, a, as an opportunity. It doesn't mean that I won't stop studying the United States, but I, I really, again, my bias, my bias is to say you not only need to do the sector studies, but you need to do them comparatively. One, if I can just add that one thing, uh, Jerry mentioned Australia. If you look at what Australia is doing, um, I was just over there in November and they have a, sort of an entity that we don't have called CRITO, which is the Center for Research on Information, Inter in Industrial Technology, I don't know, something like that. Uh, but it's a national <coughs> research institute, essentially. And um, we wrote a report with Brookings several years ago called The Case for a National Innovation Foundation. And basically, a lot of countries have these NSFs for innovation, if you will. And one of the things CRITO is doing is they're, they're launching a pretty interesting uh, in a sectoral analysis of services innovation and looking at five or six key sectors of their economy, financial services, healthcare, I can't remember the others. Uh, and that's an example of how one could do that. The, the Finns have done this uh, through their, their organization called Tekas. They've done a number of different sectoral studies, wood products. There's a natural for Finland. If you're in Finland, you've got a lot of wood, a lot of furniture. Uh, so we could do that uh, if we wanted to. We don't have to create a new institution. We could, uh, we could empower NIST. Uh, NIST has been reorganized under Pat Gallagher's leadership, and they have a more robust uh, and analytical uh, effort there going on now, a group. And we could task them with taking on maybe three or four different sectoral analyses every year, subcontracted out to people like Jerry and others. That's one thing we could do. The other thing we could do is we could start to institutionalize the implementation of some of these things. Um, for example, if you look at construction, uh, this event we did last week, the Korean uh, construction industry's productivity growth rate over the last decade and a half has been 10 times greater annualized than the U.S. construction industry. Now, you could just say that happens to be luck. But it perhaps is due to the fact that they have a Korean construction innovation and productivity strategy. They have an institute they fund. They do collaborative research with, with the companies. Uh, and so we could, for example, have a joint effort in the White House where we have a DOD, the big buyers of construction services, the DOD, HUD, uh, GSA, and then also NIST, and really put together a better strategy for construction uh, and innovation. Part of that's about how the federal government buys construction services. That there are really interesting things they could do as a smart buyer that would drive the industry. There are real challenges around shared innovation challenges that the industry just won't solve on their own because it's a really bifurcated and tiny industry. And so having groups like NIST play a role in getting the industry together. There's a group called Theatech, which is sort of like Semitech for the construction industry. Theatech is a wonderful organization, but it is their budget is probably smaller than our ITIS budget, and that's that we're talking small now. So uh, 
we could do some of these things with not a lot of money. Uh, healthcare is another great example. I mean, we all talk about healthcare costs and stuff, but where is the national healthcare transformation strategy around innovation? Because we don't have one. So I think there's a lot we could do. We just choose not to. Uh, on health, there's a new initiative that just came out. It's one of my areas I have to keep monitoring. And uh, the government has put out very large grants for um, up to thirty million dollars. I think they're willing to give uh, to various, probably states and large, uh, public uh, insurance companies, uh, plans for reorganizing, trying to show that it has an impact on uh, healthcare costs and quality and so on. So, but that is the first thing went out in January. So that's how new it is. Mm -hmm. But there will be a, uh, initiatives every six months in that area. Bill? Could you talk about, you had an interesting comment about they tend not to fund uh, grand challenges long enough or prizes long enough. I know that DARPA did not expect to have to be as long in the DARPA net as in fact they were. They made their proof of yeah. concepts, and in order to get the military to adopt it, they in fact ended up subsidizing it for years. Uh, are there? Do you have any catalogs of that in your book, or or? Uh, no, it, it's it, uh, uh, it, it's a it's a very good question, but unfortunately, I haven't cataloged that. I mean, I, I, I indeed, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to do an applied research project on advanced technology products was precisely the hypothesis that, that a lot of them uh, could have been more successful if they had kept on uh, funding for another three years. But when I went back to look at some of the proof of concept companies, they had sort of evaporated and disappeared. And I, and I, I gave it up as a, as a challenge. But that would be, that would be the uh, one kind of database. Uh, Incotel would be another one. Uh, they might have. I'm sure they have a database on that. It's just I've never, I've never bothered to collect that kind of data. Maybe a couple more questions, then we'll close. Uh, James Sang, IBM retired. You've talked about the importance of teams and networks. Can you say a few words about the um, process of either organically or managerially growing? teams and networks. I'm thinking particularly because I'm from IBM, there's a famous Fred Brooks book called The Mystical Man Machine, which points out that teams and organizations can actually get in their own way and become too big. And this question of how you know what the right size for a particular sector of, of a useful team is, is you know, kind of critical. You're, you're, you're raising a question I've worried about for 50 years, and I have never really been able to come up with the correct answer. <laughs> I've never been able to come up with the answers. I'm wondering with you. <laughs> However, if I'm allowed to think off the top of my head, <laughs> uh, let me try something. Uh, one of the things that the book points out is that the real problem in teams is communication. C and uh, communication tends to break down as it grows in diversity and size. The book gives a series of procedures for how to solve that problem. There's various mechanisms. But what I would you do is suggest that that can be a diagnostic tool that when, even with the mechanisms that are being advocated uh, for overcoming communication blockages in a diverse team, that starts going down, then we need to split it. Now there is evidence at the organizational level of why organizations have to be differentiated into separate organizations and can't keep growing in size. And that's because as the diversity grows, the communication channels become overloaded. It's a similar idea. So then you have to bifurcate or differentiate. By the way, that's the problem with our national uh, public laboratories. A lot of them are growing too big. They need to be broken up into smaller organizations to make them more effective, in my opinion. Uh, well, great. Thank you. Uh, so, I appreciate everybody uh, coming. This was a fascinating discussion. Uh, the video and the slides will be up on the website if you want to uh, review them in more detail, especially the slides you didn't get a chance to look at. Uh, go through Jerry. Uh, so, please thank, uh, join me in, in, in thanking Jerry. Thank you.